Well, hello and welcome to our third webinar, our CPR Inset webinar on fintech and digital currencies. Uh, my name is Antonio Fatas, and I'll be I'm a professor of economics at Inset, and I'll be the moderator of this webinar. Uh, I'm hoping I'll do better than Chris Wallace, the moderator of the presidential debate uh, yesterday evening. Uh, and my two speakers have promised that they won't interrupt each other as much in that debate. Now, today's topic is about the, the welfare effects of financial innovation. Uh, financial innovation on one hand is, is sold to all of us as a tool for maybe democratizing access to financial markets uh, and promoting financial inclusion. At the same time, technology is subject to increasing returns to scale, to network effects, and it might lead to a dominance of small players that become really large in markets that are dominated by winner take all dynamics. So the sort of this trade off between the potential financial inclusion and competition, and we want to address these issues. Now we have two speakers that have done a lot of work in these areas. Uh, I'm going to introduce them briefly and then pass the floor to them. Aaron Klein is a fellow in economic studies and he serves as the policy director at the Center on Regulation and Markets at Brookings Institutions, a think tank in the US. He's done a lot of writings on, on, on this area and issues related to financial regulation and technology, and he also has extensive policy experience. And our second speaker will be Thomas Philippon, who's a professor of finance at NYU Stern, the business school. He has published many academic articles on financial markets, some of them in particular focusing on technology. And his recent book, The Great Reversal, it makes an interesting analysis of how the level of competition, not just in financial markets, has evolved in the US in comparison to other countries. Now, they're going to raise two particular issues in each of their short presentations. But in the Q&A that will follow, we might go to other issues. Participants are allowed to send questions and you can write those questions at any point in time by using the Q&A function on Zoom. I'll pick some of those questions uh, after they do their presentations. The timing is 45 minutes for the webinar. I'll give 10 minutes for a short presentation to each of the speakers. Now, let me start with Aaron. Aaron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio Thomas. It's a pleasure to join you. I really appreciate this chance to discuss the tremendous benefits and excitement that financial inclusion and can, can, we can reach through financial technology. Uh, certainly after having watched last night's uh, presidential debate in the United States, I need something more uplifting. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of problems that are inherent in this technology. And the other core issue is I don't think we've done a very good job of understanding what the real impediments are to achieving the goals of financial inclusion. That is, we say financial inclusion by definition means including everybody as part of the financial system without thinking through that the actual problems involved are often not necessarily of access, but of cost. And so with that in mind, I'm going to go through an example of how financial technology failed to address a core problem, um, which is how the U.S. government was going to send our emergency stimulus payments. So let me make sure. Does everybody see my screen here? Good. So we all know the basic story. COVID giant shock. America decides... Uh, uh, surprisingly, to act quickly, eventually Congress gives a giant fiscal stimulus, including giving $1,200 to every man, woman, uh, and $500 per child. So how do we do in getting that money out, right? That's the policy decision at the end of March. Finance kick in, get the money in people's hands as quickly as possible, right? This is an emergency. So how did we do? Well, here is how the stimulus payments went out. For two weeks, we did nothing. The third week, uh, we sent about 80 million payments. By about the fifth week, this is you know over uh, 30 days in the middle of an emergency, we weren't even halfway there. Uh, and today still, uh, 10 weeks after, there's still about 9 million people that don't have access. So this shows you the limits of government's ability to perform a, the most basic function, which is to give people money. Uh, uh, in my opinion, this is stunningly poor when you consider the fact that you can access any content in the world almost streaming on your television 
far faster than the government can provide this. So what went wrong? Well, let's start with what you needed. You needed three things. Number one, everybody needs an account, a way to receive the money. Number two, the federal government needs the information to match people in their accounts. And number three, the infrastructure has to be there to move the money. What you'll find in careful analysis, and I'm gonna walk you through, the accounts aren't the problem. The information in the infrastructure was what held us back to achieving the goal of getting money in people's hands quickly. This is incredibly important because so much of the conversation focuses on accounts. So much of it focuses on universal access. Access is important. It's one of the three things that are necessary, but it's not the biggest impediment we're currently facing. And understanding the current failures helps explain how if you're gonna harness this technology, what needs to be done differently. Okay, so let's start with the banking status of the American system. Two thirds of Americans are fully banked. Uh, the underbanked, which is a quarter to a fifth of the population are defined as people who have an account, but use a non-bank service like a payday lender, a wire transmitter, or a check casher. Only six and a half percent of Americans are unbanked. 93.5% of households have an account. Uh, so, so this is a problem, but it's not that big of a problem relative to the attention it's received. In addition, why do those 6.5% people not have an account? Not The traditional stories you hear are one, they don't trust the banking system, there's a lack of privacy, the, the bank isn't convenient to them. These are all things FinTech could in theory uh, uh, transform, right? It doesn't matter when, when your bank is open or where it is, if your bank can be in your pocket. These are minor issues in terms of why these people are not banked. When you ask them, the number one reason shouldn't surprise people. The accounts are too expensive. They lack the money. Now, you say, what do you mean the accounts are expensive? They're free. Ah, they're free if you have money. If you have money, the account is free. The bank views you as a profitable customer and they're gonna make money from you and other services. If you don't have money, the bank charges you tremendous amounts. I'm not just talking about monthly fees, I'm talking about $35 every time you overdraft a pernicious product in the United States that by some estimate generates $35 billion a year from a bank profit taken from people who run out of money. If half of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, this, these are the costs they're facing. And a subset of them are saying, look, the costs of having this account are too large. One other picture not done here. About two to three million Americans are on the do not bank list. This is a list involving money laundering. It's involving past bank closure for failure to pay bills. And that alone accounts for about 20 to 30% of the households, the 6.5% of households that don't have accounts. Money laundering, expense of the account are the primary causes, not all these other things. So now we've done a deep dive into the smaller group. Let's go back to the bigger group. What's the problem? Why well, need to know your account? So this direct deposit with the treasury said, so we're just gonna put the money in your bank account. Well, a couple of things, right? Number one, the treasury doesn't know your bank account. It only knew it for a small subset of people. Beyond that, it had the wrong account for 25 million people. Let me explain how that is. This is a big, big group, right? More than the number of unbanked Americans. These people use a tax preparation service and the tax preparation service advances them their refund as part of the service for providing their taxes and gets a pretty hefty fee on that. In order to structure that, they create what I'll call a shell bank account where the I, they tell the IRS to deposit the refund and the tax preparer gets that refund because they've given them the tax refund in advance to the individual. So the IRS thinks, because you've filed your taxes, that this is your bank account when in point of fact it isn't. So what did that leave? 70 plus million Americans, the IRS didn't know your account. So they created a whole new website, tell us your account. It's kind of insane when you consider that somehow through FinTech, Stripe and Plaid and the rest, right? My account can be figured out by my phone almost immediately. Uh, 
you ended up in all these other low tech ways of getting people money, paper checks, plastic debit cards, 9 million people are still waiting. The information problem is compounded by America's poor financial infrastructure. Direct deposit is not direct. If you're gonna get paid on Thursday, your employer probably took the money out of their account on, on Monday. Depending on where you are in the country, ACH can take anywhere from the same day to four days to clear. The ACH is the Federal Reserve's automated clearinghouse system. Now technology here can solve this. There's been a private clearinghouse that built a real-time system. You see new fintechs like Square announcing same-day payroll service to try and help businesses manage that three-day thing. But the government still uses the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is not updating our payment system anytime soon. They put out a big announcement. This is supposed to come out in 2024. Uh, anybody think when the government says something's going to take three years, it's going to take three or four years, probably take longer. True in private sector too. It's not just government. Uh, and the U.S. is a complete outlier in this. If you look at how the rest of the world developed real-time payments, you'll see this is a ubiquitous technology in the rest of the world. That gives me a little bit of comfort that the rest of the world will be able to harness fintech for good faster than the United States because they've solved the infrastructure problem. The information problem remains both a public policy issue and depending on, on the market, potentially problematic in the private space. Uh, and, and the account issue is an issue, but it's way overblown in terms of its magnitude and significance in precluding FinTech from, include, from enhancing financial inclusion. I look forward to Thomas's presentation and, and uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you for sticking to the time. So I'll pass the floor to Tama. Tama, your floor is yours. Thank you. So in keeping with the topic, FinTech competition and financial inclusion, thank you so much for inviting me. And it's great to be on the panel with Antonio and Aaron. Um, so I want to make three points. Uh, the first one is that um, there is some reason to be cautiously optimistic about the behavior of the finance industry. It looks like finally it's getting uh, cheaper and more efficient. Um, and then I want to make two uh, claims, I suppose. One is, uh, will fintech increase access to asset management services? I think the answer is yes, uh, in general. So I'm optimistic there. Will it reduce discrimination? Uh, is actually it turns out, I think, to be a more complicated question. And I think the answer is probably yes, but it's unlikely to get rid of it entirely. So first claim, this is my long running uh, work on, on finance that I started you know, 10 years ago, actually more than 10 years ago, and, um, and trying to update somewhat regularly, trying to figure out the unit cost of intermediation. So this is a measure of, uh, in, in the broadest possible sense, the, the gap between um, the expected return on savers and the funding cost of borrowers, okay? Um, and that could materialize in equity market, fixed income market, in deposit markets. And uh, so if you can get all these markets together, 200 basis points you see on this graph is on average, the cut that finance takes, and it shows up as a, either higher cost of fund for borrowers or lower return on savers. And of course, in reality, both a bit. So what was striking to me when I started this research was the fact that I was expecting a strong decline in, in this number uh, with the introduction of IT and new technologies. So I was, I was thinking that starting in the, somewhere in the 90s, we would see a steep and prolonged decline in the unit cost of intermediation. But we didn't see that. In fact, it's pretty flat in the 90s. Um, and uh, it's only in recent years, in particular post-crisis, that we find us, finally see a drift uh, downwards, um, especially in the, in the quality adjusted measure that takes into account the fact that today we try to uh, bank and lend to uh, creditors that are a bit more complicated to lend to than in the past. That's why you have this quality adjusted measure. So I think uh, some of it is fintech, some of it is other reasons, but uh, if you look at the data, there is some idea that finance is getting finally a bit cheaper on a unit cost basis. So that's the good news. Um, now, 
what can we expect uh, in terms of distribution, in terms of inequality? Um, and let's think first about asset management, because I think asset management is somewhat simpler, actually, uh, to analyze than credit. Um, asset management is a question of uh, you know, searching, finding uh, the place to park your money, and making the right choices. Okay, so, um, and then the danger, or at least the discussion was focused on the fact that new technologies, maybe they are great, but they are characterized by increasing returns, increasing returns. That means maybe as Antonio was saying earlier, there's some winner take all issue. Um, but, um, so here I want to just point out that there are two types of fixed costs. And if you think about it in the right way, I believe you conclude that it's gonna be good for everybody. So, uh, Asset management cost, you have a cost per relationship. So that's fee per client. Okay, so that would be like the cost of maintaining your account in, the, in an asset management sense, or the fees you charge. Okay, um, and then there's a cost. So that's small fee in my model, and big fee is the big cost for setting up the entire business. Okay, so these are two types of fixed costs one a fixed cost per client, the other one is a fixed cost to set up the business. But they play out very differently. So if you write any model with heterogeneity in wealth, uh, w among households, then this kind of model is going to have two key conditions. One is the participation cutoff. It says that there's going to be a cutoff in the distribution W bar such that, and that W bar is proportional to the cost per client, such that people whose wealth is below W bar, they are priced out, just too expensive for them to maintain an account. Uh, they don't have enough wealth to justify that account. It's very consistent with what Aaron was saying earlier. So that gives you one cutoff, okay? And then the other one, the big fee, is the cost of uh, setting up the business. Now, in terms of fintech, it, a lot of it means actually writing the algo to be able to, uh, so that the robot uh, advisor can run and, and have plans. Okay, and that one is pinned down by by the entry condition. So the expected profit of the fintech as a firm has to at least break even to cover the fixed cost. Okay, so these are the two key conditions. And in that world, you can think of a, a robot advisor has something with a high entry cost. Like it is very costly to set up a robot advisor. But once it's up and running, adding one client is very cheap. Okay. Um, so it's high fixed cost of entry, low fixed cost per relationship. And then, so now uh, here's the theorem, which is if you write this model and you look at the equilibrium, then you can show that if FinTech entry is profitable, that is, if it has a chance of entering that market to compete with traditional asset manager, then it's always true that participation in the fintech equilibrium F is going to be better than participation in the banking or traditional equilibrium at the bottom. Always, okay. And the intuition is not that complicated, which is at the end of the day, if you think about the entry condition, the big accounts are going to be the one covering the big entry cost upfront. But exposed, once you've entered and you've paid a big fixed cost, um, then at the margin, you are going to, it is profitable for you to offer these services to smaller accounts because the cost per relationship is low. So indirectly, it looks as if the big accounts are subsidizing the smaller accounts, which is, that's the key reason why in this class of model, participation is going to increase. Okay, so I think that's, that's my prediction for asset management. Now, um, the credit market is different because there is a much larger issue of uh, discrimination in the credit market. Um, so if you look at the traditional model that we've had to look at uh, discrimination, uh, both rational, well, rational, I don't know if it's the right word, but like, you know, Bayesian type of discrimination and non-Bayesian based on, on prejudice. Um, I think um, the, the, the basic model is uh, likely to tell you that FinTech is gonna be less biased than, uh, human uh, lenders um, because human lenders, they meet face to face. So they have to, they, they actually see the person in front. So all kind of prejudice can come in there. The algorithm has the advantage that it doesn't see the person. So at least that you remove that bias. Now, um, whether that's gonna be enough to make the end result positive depends on a few things. The most important one at the technical level is how you train the algorithms. And conceptually, you can think of two ways of training the algorithm. One would be directly on the, on the end outcome, which is, so say it's a credit model, then you, all you input in the data is, do people actually default? Okay, so you, the actual outcome, and you train the algo to predict that outcome. That's gonna get rid of human biases. 
you might end up with still, of course, on Bayesian discrimination, but he's going to get rid of all the big, uh, you know, prejudice uh, biases that human have. Um, but that's not the only way to use algo. Sometimes people in some firms can use algorithm just to replace humans. And then sometimes the simplest thing is to train the algo to replicate the human decisions. Okay, so then you don't train them on the outcome, whether that person from that minority group actually defaulted, you train them on replicating what the lending officer would have done. Okay, well then by construction, the algo is gonna replicate human biases. Okay, and in fact, in most cases, you can show it's gonna make it worse because it's gonna optimize to replicate that and it's gonna optimize over the biases themselves. So it turns out there, the key question is, or the key policy is make sure you train on actual outcomes, not on replicating uh, human biases. The open question in the literature, I think in part is, um, what about behavioral biases? And uh, the, the risk potentially is, we know that traditional lenders have learned over time to exploit behavioral biases among people. Um, there's lots of research showing that. The question is whether the algorithms are gonna do that to a larger extent than humans did in the past. Uh, to wrap up, I think to me, the big open issues are, um, you know, like the, everything around the issue of data ownership uh, and APIs. You, you cannot imagine a model which is inclusive and competitive without a clear, you know, protocol for APIs. And uh, that requires a lot of steps because it, it, like the issue of liability when you have data management, be able to trace, if there is a data leak, be able to trace where the leak happened. These are absolutely critical issues. And I don't think we have a good uh, regulatory system anywhere in the world now to be able to fully exploit the technology. Um, and then in terms of regulatory challenges, I think that um, we're making progress, but we also see the challenges coming up now. I mean, regulating algorithm is not the same as people. Um, and uh, you know, the, the compliance approach to have a like, clear process and you check the box for each step, that works with human compliance. It's not going to work very well with algorithms. The other thing I see coming is we were quite optimistic, like the sandbox, I remember the debate of sandbox, you know, the, the idea of giving light regulation to FinTech uh, that was very lively five or six years ago, especially uh, with the, uh, the British regulators pushing that and showing that it can work. The problem is that uh, clearly that maybe you can apply that to some product or some uh, financial risks. But when you look at uh, compliance with uh, you know, KYC or AML, then you clearly don't want to give the FinTech uh, a break. And if you're too lenient and too confident that just because something is a FinTech, it's gonna do well, then you end up with Wirecard. So I think these are the challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so we'll start a round of questions. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions. I'll pick some from, from the audience as well. Anyone who has a question, please type it on the Q&A. Uh, let me start raising a question about payments, which is the topic that Aaron brought up, but, but I think that, that my question is going to be broader than just the specific uh, payment issue. Um, again, when you compare in particular the US to other countries, you realize how it's not just about the technology the technology is available sort of everywhere we all have the same devices in our pockets but, but you see very different outcomes and if you look just to look for an extreme if you look at china here in asia you see mobile payments everywhere you see the, the, the appearance of electronic wallets now that's a model that has not worked at all in the in the us for many reasons but one of the reasons which i remember reading one of your earlier articles is about the credit card culture in the us which is very unique uh, and it sort of is a barrier to innovation, which is a combination of lack of competition, but it's also culture that, that, that makes the US outcome completely different from the rest. Again, how much any technology change will ever be able to overcome that? Will there be a new technology that will sort of overcome this or are we stuck in an equilibrium in different countries based on that history? So, so yeah, so, so let, me, let me be clear, because I think you're right, but I would substitute the word culture for economics. So when I use my American Express in the United States, I pay 98% of the cost of the good, right? I get 2% off in these rewards, which are not taxed. So if you think of it in relation to pre-tax income, it's about 3%. That's a lot, right? Because that's on the gross flows of payments, 
that I'm making. So if I charge $100,000 a year, I'm getting the equivalent of $3,000 of weekly earnings, which is about 6%, 5 6% of the median wage of the household. This is a giantly regressive system. One of the big reasons that we have this system is merchants are required if you accept one card of a brand to accept all. If I accept the basic Visa credit card, I must accept the Sapphire, right? That case was litigated before the Supreme Court Amex v. Ohio. It was decided five to four in favor of Amex against Ohio. And so Ohio had a law that said merchants can pick which card within a bundle. So, you know, I think, Antonio, to the extent that the legal structure in the U.S. advantages the payment system to be able to extract large rents from merchants, which in effect are cross subsidizations by everybody who doesn't have access to high income cards, right? Our payment system is so warped in the U.S. that it's it's logically equivalent to at the cash register, say, show me your your how much money you made last year. The more you made, the less you pay. The less you made, the more you pay, right? Cash and debit and prepaid are subsidizing this. You could change that by law, by, by a better interpretation of the law by a court. Congress could rewrite that law. You could tax these benefits that we're getting in credit cards. There are lots of ways that you could economically counter that. However, until you do that, it's very difficult to provide a customer a, a convenience improvement in technology that is worth more than the cost, than the, than the, than the rebate they're getting from the, from the payment system. So because you exclude the high income consumer from adopting this technology, you don't create enough transaction volume because it's all an economy of scale in payments, nor do you necessarily get that ubiquity from the low income model. And this creates what I think is a, a larger, longer, more permanent barrier in the United States to adopting a more efficient system like China has. Thank you. I, you just answered one of the questions in the Q&A about whether FinTech can address rising inequality. You just gave an example where you can create even more inequality. Now, let me, in terms let me of sort the of pass this question to Tomas. Well, yeah. Before you answer, Tomah, one, one, because I wanted to highlight something that comes from your book, The Great Reversal. Um, you, you've talked a lot about the contrast between Europe and the US when it comes to competition. Now, in payments, there's a big contrast as well. Payments are a lot cheaper in Europe than in the US, but it's not quite about competition because a lot of these payment systems are created for the, from the traditional incumbents, right? It's not created by new entrants. It's just the banks getting together with the central bank and creating an infrastructure, which is very efficient. So it's not quite competition. Again, it might be back to the economics of credit cards or it's just pure regulation maybe. Yeah, I think that the economics of credit card is actually fascinating in many respects and payment in general. So it's true that uh, in the way it is in Europe now, it's mostly the outcome of regulation. Um, also payment in the US is very efficient for some subsector of the economy. For big corporates, payment is quite efficient actually. Um, but for uh, smaller firms and, and poor households, it's very inefficient. So that's the, the inequity that Aaron was mentioning. Um, and uh, for the payment also, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is um, many of the solutions we have now are just run on, the, on the, the plumbing of the old system. So the Apple, when you pay with the Apple uh, solution on your phone, you actually, it's really the innovation is the, the tiny bit at the end which is important, it's, it helps a lot with the safety of the transaction, for instance, but it's not really changing the plumbing in the background. And I think there, the issue probably is people are fully unaware of that. I think there's a big transparency issue. And then that's, that ties up to the, the case that everyone was mentioning. To me, the shocking thing is like, you know, the, that the fact that the card company can impose to merchants that they cannot discriminate, they cannot, you know, tell their clients, well, if you free to use any card you want, but I'll charge you the difference. You know, that, and so people are fully unaware of what they pay. They are unaware of the cost. And they're also unaware of the, of the, the extent of the innovation. They don't realize that the Apple Pay innovation is really like a very small innovation at the, at the very, very end of the transaction. So I think there is a lot more transparency there. Which way to go? I think in the case of credit card, I would just be in favor of uh, 
like a much more uh, giving giving merchant much more leeway to um, to discriminate to just or pass on the fees. I mean, now you're raising the issue of uh, of sort of like competition of different players uh, in these markets. Uh, Again, some of the players in these markets coming come from a world which is not the financial world. Uh, in particular, in some countries, they come from the big tech world, uh, and they treat these products, whether it's payments, whether it's credit, sort of as a side product of a much bigger proposition. Whether you run an e-commerce platform or you run a smartphone platform. Uh, now, when it comes to issues that I mean, both of you have been addressing in the past many, many times of financial regulation. How, how does these big players change the notion of financial regulation? Because you're not just regulating a product, you're regulating almost a product which is a side show of a much bigger company, which is after something which is not purely the financial uh, outcome. Yeah, I think they are the unfortunate, there is an un unfortunate uh, coincidence of uh, two things happening at the same time. In the grand scheme of things, if you wanted to have a really efficient payment system, you would want you would want the Amazon and Facebook and Apple's to be involved because they are really good at doing these kind of things. So, in, from a technical perspective, you you would be in favor of them entering that that system. But that happens precisely at the time where, for a, a host of other reasons, they've become so big and dominant that we don't want them to start doing even more. So that I think is one of the, the downside of when firms get really big, uh, then you, you worry that you don't want them to expand even more, even in places where they would actually be pretty good at. And so that's, an, that's a very unexpected downside of this issue. Um, and I think you see it in, honestly, you can see it in healthcare too. You think about what would be the right place to have, you know, to, to centralize all the information about health, have, a very efficient way to transfer the information if you show up in a hospital or anywhere instead of spending you know half an hour just digging out your files and, and never finding them correctly i think you could have one app on your phone that does everything that would be fantastic but that means that means you would need to trust these guys with all of your data and do it and today i don't think people are going to do that it's too risky so let me let me just add a couple points because i think uh, tomas's point on privacy is spot on and it retards a lot of innovation in both healthcare and banking. But the privacy rules, at least in the US, like the banking rules, are not structured along, are structured on the basis of assuming a different set of, of technology available and don't correspond well to the new emerging technology. So by which I mean privacy and banking, right? Uh, is tied, let's take this anti-discrimination case. In the US, you're not allowed to discriminate on the basis uh, for banks in lending, right? You can as a, as a different type of merchant, right? It is probably illegal for a bank to offer a Mac user a lower interest rate than a, than a, a PC user, even if the Mac user is a better credit risk as a lot of the data indicates. It's totally legal for Home Depot to charge two different prices depending on what takes you to their website, right? In fact, they've been caught doing that. Similarly with privacy, it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of marriage. But we know for a fact that the dissolution of a marriage is one of the primary reasons why consumers don't pay debt. Fintechs may have a good idea about whose marriage is in trouble, right? Google, you know, your Google search history may tell you a lot more about the stability of your marriage coupled with financial transactions that you've started making. What level of privacy do we want to have and how does that bump up against anti-discrimination that exists in banking, but not in tech, right? Technology can totally change how they advertise to you based on what they service you. Similarly, in the US, payments is not part of what makes a legal entity a bank. A bank is defined by the taking of deposits and the making of loans. In fact, you can be a non-bank payment transmitter, which is a state licensed entity. And so we have a regulatory and legal framework that just isn't prepared for this new level of technology. And it creates a lot of moral and legal dilemma. Uh, and it's not clear to me a priori, right? Do I want uh, to get a, a lower risk 
uh, a, do I want to allow companies to use all this information to price more accurately and lean against cross subsidization? Or do I value privacy and anonymity and I'm going to tolerate cross subsidization because it's a higher social value? And, and we don't have a good answer for that. No, I completely agree. Just uh, one thing on, on that, it follows off a broader uh, issue. Um, if you think about fintech today, which is there are two reasons why fintech can enter and be successful in the market. A, they actually innovate and do something useful. B, they just do regulatory arbitrage. Um, and we know in, in the real world, innovators always do a mix of both. I mean, Uber or, um, you know, um, all, all the apps that try to shortcut uh, existing uh, services, they are partly arbitrage of regulations, uh, partly true innovations. So that's not, not, but I think the key thing in, in finance is that the regulations are so heavy that the scope for regulatory arbitrage is larger than in other industries. So that's why I think we need to be even more careful. Um, and uh, just my sense is at least for some of the question we had six months ago, we're gonna get the answer from the COVID crisis. For instance, all the answer about whether FinTech was actually properly battle tested. Well, we'll see, we'll find out now, you know. And removing an issue that was mentioned before, uh, which has to do with uh, how do we ensure interoperability of all these players? And this is a key way, a key way to get uh, more competition. Now you mentioned Toma APIs uh, and the idea of open banking, which is obviously very prevalent in some countries. Uh, and clearly, once you open your bank account to others or like providers of services, you can get competition that otherwise you wouldn't be able to. The European Union has released a draft today that they might run through some of the big tech companies about how data should be shared across different platforms, which again is a very radical approach to how you share your data. Now, the technology is sort of there. I think the APIs are there. The idea of sharing and owning your own, tech, own data seems to be there. Now, how far are we from a world that looks like that? I mean, is this just a dream that will never happen or is it a matter of years when the technology gets implemented and gets enforced by the regulators? I think two things. One, and I'm gonna let, I mean, I'm sure Aaron knows more about this than me. To me, there's one issue which is not solved is liability because it's very hard to agree on liability. Once you have a data leak and who is liable in the chain, that's very tricky. And so and unless we solve that, I think we, it's always going to be quite limited in the, the true impact uh, because you're taking a lot of risk in, if you start sharing your, your data. And so that's going to limit the, uh, the expansion of this, of this market and, and to some extent competition as well. Um, so I think solving the liability issue is, is first order. And uh, after that, the, for the regulation, I think uh, we're going to have to have some learning by doing. In other words, it's going to be like uh, we're going to have some stuff is going to happen, then then we're going to have some cases decided, and then we're going to have some case law or jurisprudence, and then we can move forward. The idea we can jump directly to the right outcome, that's not going to happen. So I'd, I'd add uh, two things. One is uh, I think it's important to go back and see how these questions were solved in the past. When debit card technology was coming out, there was a huge debate in the United States in the 70s about this liability question, if the debit card is stolen or fraud has occurred, right? On the one hand, you had consumer groups worried that somebody's entire bank account was exposed. On the other hand, the bank said, well, we, we can't have infinite liability if somebody loses their card and doesn't tell us. And there were huge political debates about this. It culminated in the Electronic Funds Transfer Act which I think a careful analysis shows was a Kosian solution, by which I mean they established what at the time was a very high threshold for losses, right, up to $1,000, which in, in the 70s was, was far greater uh, in, in terms of earnings adjustment. And that liability was on the consumer. But the infinite liability was eventually placed on, on the depository institution. The result, the depository institution had enough... Uh, liability to create a system whereby once they put in those high fixed costs, the system worked so well that they started competing down the liability to the uh, user so that today, almost all accounts, you have first dollar loss in coverage. 
And my takeaway there, thinking of, from my political background, the political fights involved in setting that dollar threshold must have been just knocked down, drag out. And in the end, they were irrelevant. And so if we could get a type, the biggest problem is in the absence of assigning this property right and liability, you, you have too much fear and a, a lack of innovation. So I, I kind of, uh, uh, I kind of am a little less concerned with how we end up setting these rights, as long as we make them easily tradable and we create market incentives uh, to solve the problem. But the politics will focus a lot on that liability right. The final point I'd make is uh, the politics are, are poor. Economists tend to assume stated and revealed preferences are similar. I found no bigger delta between the two than when it comes to privacy. If you ask people how much do they value their privacy, you get very large responses. And then when you say, you know, do you want to give up your real time geographic location to the, one of the world's largest companies? And in exchange, we're just going to tell you the fastest road home, right? People love Google Maps. And so the politics of this become uh, 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 difficult because you can have two diametrically opposed policies that each show 80% popular approval, but whether or not you're polling stated preference or revealed preference. And in that way, I'm a little pessimistic that we're gonna be able to solve the, this problem uh, uh, absent some giant external shock. All the data leaks up to now have not created a political pressure to have one side or the other dominate this debate. Just one small thing here, um, yeah. you know, I agree there's a huge gap between stated and revealed preferences. I think perhaps some of the gap is because of data externalities. That is, if you ask me in general, am I in favor of privacy protection? Yes. If everybody did, that would be great. But me playing Nash equilibrium alone, not really. So if, if my behavior is the, what you see is the Nash equilibrium I'm playing by myself, taking as given that everybody else is sharing their data, then, then that would create a gap just right there by itself. And let me bring a last question for the two of you, which comes from several questions from the audience, which we, we haven't talked not much about emerging markets. We've talked a lot about Europe, the US, and, and some of the difficulties there. Uh, now, in some of the evidence of emerging markets says that fintech has made a difference. Uh, again, we all have the example of mobile payments in Africa. We have the examples of, so like microfinancing, uh, and, and we've seen sort of a, a step in the right direction. So some of the people in the audience were asking that, do emerging markets benefit from fintech more? And some are reflecting that there's also limits because sometimes the infrastructure is not as good. Some of these markets are moving into cryptocurrencies, P2P, so like systems which might not be easy to regulate or control. Um, I mean, is there a more optimistic view of, of what fintech has done for those markets according to each of you? Well, there's a great uh, recent paper by Stephen Hamilton on, uh, on this where he surveys uh, and we can put it on the website after I can send you the link uh, where it does. And it looks extremely positive. Yeah, in all pretty much all dimension in emerging markets, the, the extent to which fintech has helped uh, bank the unbanked, uh, leapfrog banking altogether, and overall like increased financial uh, inclusion, it looks very good. So, yeah, I mean, I would agree that I think emerging markets could benefit a lot, particularly as it relates to leapfrogging. And I point out that you have to think very carefully about the different problems. China's dominance in mobile payments and the rise of Ali Chat and, and WePay is really stunning, right? You had a country that had universal banking, right? The government made sure everybody had an account. In fact, they usually had two, right? So it wasn't at all the lack of accounts in, in, or a functional alternative payment system, right? What you had in China were a couple different things. One, you had very low denomination cash, so and a fair amount of paper counterfeiting. Two, you had merchants that just refused to adopt the legacy system and pay the costs of interchange at a way that's very different from the US where the merchants eat it and then cross subsidize or Europe where they pass directly to the consumer. And to China, they just said, we're not gonna take it. So when, when technology firms, and they both came at the payment system very differently, 
right? WeChat starts out trying to solve how do I upload money for a video game, right? QQ. Um, and, and it comes at it very differently. And all of a sudden, the adoption takes off like that because the technological barriers to networking and being interconnected are, are, are infinitesimally small. And you see a giant culture shift. These are large networks, right? Their end state are they people want one or two or three ways to move their money and they want what they really want is ubiquity. If, if I walk into it to a place blind, I want to know that it'll work there. Uh, and I don't think we're done seeing what Ali and, and WeChat, how they're going to leverage that data, how they're going to leverage those, those flows. Uh, and a lot of folks, I think, get Libra wrong. They think of Facebook thinking about challenging the banking industry. In my mind, what Facebook is doing is seeing what WeChat did. That's their competitor here. And they want to they want to replicate what they did. So they're not they're playing catch up to where WeChat is. They're just trying to solve the problem in the in a global system, not in a closed loop Chinese based context. Thank you. Well, we'll finish with that more optimistic view on fintech and talking about emerging markets with three minutes past our time. So, so let me thank the two speakers, Tama and Aaron, for their presentations and their willingness to come to the seminar. And obviously for all the audience to, to attend this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening or have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank you.